my name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from World Tourism Network today in Honolulu, Hawaii. And with us right now are you, our uh, readers, our viewers around the world on eTobo News, on Livestream.Travel, Hawaii News Online, Aviation, wherever you are uh, watching us right now. Welcome, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. It's a really exciting time because uh, we're introducing another hero, and this is not just any hero. It's Jens, and I probably pronounce he's German. I should know his names, but his name, his last name, is definitely not German. Uh, Trenhard, how do you pronounce it? Trenhard, yes. Trenhard, okay. <laughs> it's German, yes. <laughs> he's a German in Bangkok, but. Um, Many of you may know him and may know his uh, face. Um, Jens has been involved in uh, tourism uh, for a long time, and he has been involved in sustainable tourism. He will uh, tell us a little bit more about it. And uh, he was nominated by Peter Richard, also from Thailand. Um, he is an expert in responsible tourism and community-based tourism in uh, Thailand. And for those that don't know what the Heroes Award is, it's an award actually from the World Tourism Network. And if you haven't heard about World Tourism Network, you can just go to wtn.travel or go to worldtourismnetwork.org. It's the same. It's an organization, a very young organization that's only started in December of last year after about a year of discussing COVID. And uh, we have tourism experts and people who love the travel and tourism industry from 128 countries now. We have many interest groups. And if you haven't joined us yet, become a member. And actually what you can do if you join us now, you can just use our uh, invitation code Jens. Just type in Jens and that gives you three months for free. And it's not breaking your bank. We're really not about membership fee. It's $90 a year for most people or $10 a month. And uh, we waive it if there is a reason because we want people to be part of this group. But um, a part of the World Tourism Network is our Heroes Award. And Heroes Award, you find more if you go to heroes.travel or click on the link on WTN. And you will see we have a little bit more than 20 plus heroes right now in the world. And these are people, any, any people, you don't have to be a minister of tourism. Uh, we have tour guides, we have ministers of tourism. Uh, we have former foreign ministers, so we have we have um, uh, heads of uh, associations, but we also have travel agents and um, experts in research that are part of this elite group of of the hall. We call it the International Hall for Tourism Heroes. And once a year, we will actually name the tourism hero of the year. We haven't done this yet because we only started in December, um, but uh, we're getting closer to it. And um, it's an interesting way of think for people to be recognized, especially going through this COVID crisis and it's free. So if you wanted to nominate anyone, go to heroes.travel, you can nominate anyone. You can even nominate yourself, but we always require two nominations in order to consider um, your nomination or your application. So this is enough explanation. Let's go to Jens. And Jens is now officially a tourism hero. We have him on our website at heroes.travel. And uh, Jens, tell us a little bit more about you. And welcome and congratulations, first of all. Well, thank you, Thomas. And uh, obviously, we've known each other for a long time. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm obviously very honored and humbled to be uh, um, recognized as a, as a uh, tourism hero. Um, it's, uh, it, it's something obviously that's uh, very meaningful uh, because you have built with this WTN network um, a, a platform of uh, you know, tourism uh, individuals and uh, businesses that really looking to, at this point, obviously trying to navigate this pandemic and uh, connecting and, and seeing how a collaboration can really um, bring everyone forward. And uh, from my standpoint, um, so I'm uh, originally from Germany. I'm a, a, I'm a, I'm a dual Canadian a German citizen. Uh, I'm now in Bangkok for the last about, you know, I would say eight, nine years. Um, I'm the head of the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, which is a, a collaboration of the six governments uh, of the Greater Mekong subregion, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and China. 
And with China, uh, the focus is on the two provinces of uh, Southwest China, Yunnan and Guangxi. Uh, and collaboration obviously is also very important for us. So, so I mean, we've been focusing on, on collaboration. We actually have a heroes program as well. Uh, we only recognize one hero uh, uh, per, per year. Um, and we started this last year as well. So last year was uh, Gun Pojana, who's, who was the founder of the Community-Based Tourism uh, Institute of Thailand. And, and in a few weeks, we're going to announce our next uh, Mekong hero. Um, but uh, I, I've worked in, um, in hospitality, I think, for a long time. I, my, I went to hotel school in Switzerland. I got my uh, master's at Cornell University, and now I'm currently pursuing my um, doctorate degree at Hong Kong Polytech University. Hope to finish my thesis uh, before the end of this year. Um, and then I started in, in hotels. Uh, um, so, I mean, I uh, work for Kempinski Hotels, I work for Marriott Hotels, uh, and I work for Fairmont Hotels, now part of the ACO group uh, for a long time and, and was their first head of uh, e-commerce. Um, and then I moved over from hotels to tourism, uh, where I then uh, joined the Canadian Tourism Commission as the head of uh, marketing strategy, which included digital uh, and CRM and campaign management. Um, so very exciting to move from, from the, you know, the hotel side to the tourism side. And then after that, I went to China and I started uh, um, or co-founded a company called Dragon Trail Interactive. Uh, some of you may know it. We were the first uh, agency that helped travel and tourism companies to market to Chinese consumers via uh, social media and uh, online marketing. Uh, so now it obviously has grown a lot over the last uh, 10 years, but it's uh, still a very active organization based in Beijing and Shanghai and Xi'an and with offices in the UK and US as well. Um, I left China then and went to Bangkok and I was then appointed by the six governments, the Mekong region. And uh, I have actually uh, resigned. I'm actually, I had my last uh, a board meeting just last Friday. So I'm leaving uh, uh, the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office uh, in a month. I have 30 more days and, um, and, and uh, we'll look for uh, a new adventures that are out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's a quick introduction about myself. Well, wow, that's quite impressive. Uh, so you've been in this industry for a while. I think uh, that makes two of us. And but you've you've really moved around and um, um, living in Bangkok. Tell us, um, you know, I had an office in Bangkok many many years ago before you moved to Bangkok, actually. And um, I'm wondering, Bangkok is a wonderful city. Uh, I remember the time I spent a lot of time in Bangkok, going back and forth. How's Bangkok today with COVID? Well, I think uh, I would say this region has has learned a lot uh, from this pandemic, and uh, there's obviously a lot of initiatives going on. Uh, so the first thing, as we all know, is the, the pandemic is. I mean, I think vaccination is key uh, to restart tourism, and uh, uh, Thailand and other countries in the region have been a little bit slower to get their vaccination rates up. Uh, Cambodia actually, uh, surprising for some, uh, has been doing a very good job when it comes to uh, getting their vaccination rates up. Um, but Thailand always uh, is very resilient as a country. I mean, there have been a lot of, you know, uh, coups and, and, and uh, uh, hurricanes and tsunamis and all these kind of things. And, and Thailand always uh, was able to find a way to come back very quickly. And so you may have heard about the Phuket Sandbox uh, uh, an initiative to restart tourism uh, with uh, an experiment to kind of look at one island, you know, can you take one island and, and, and start tourism there? Obviously, Phuket is very uh, tourism uh, dependent. Um, so, you know, it, it yet remains to be seen if these programs are successful. But I applaud the Thai government uh, for being uh, innovative and, and, and trying things. Um, and, and, and see how uh, obviously the, the economy can be stimulated because as we all know, not just in, in this part of the world, but uh, tourism businesses, especially smaller ones, are suffering greatly and trying to stay alive and many already have shut their doors. Yeah, and that's very unfortunate in Thailand. <clears throat> for, fortunately, it's, it's one of the most resilient countries I know in tourism. Um, I've been involved in the tsunami situation um, many years ago. And um, at that point also, um, 
I remember our meetings in Phuket actually, and uh, we thought it would never rebuild, but it rebuilt pretty fast. And, 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 and Thailand has some smart people, has a, also a very large ex community with people from all over the world, like yourself, holding it together. So I'm optimistic uh, that Thailand finds the innovation um, to maneuver out of this crisis as soon as possible. And yes, the Sandbox is an interesting project. We have reported about it in Etobo News. If you go to Etobo News and click on Thailand, you find a number of stories in regards to what Thailand is doing at this time. So when you um, finish your project with Mekong, because everyone knows you're under Mekong, so that's uh, <laughs> a, a surprise. Are you planning to stay in that part of the world? Or are you planning to go back to Germany or to Canada? Or where are we going to find Jens after that? Well, I mean, I, unfortunately, I, I, I'm not allowed to to say what uh, might be next. Uh, but uh, the one thing I can say is that I will stay in tourism for sure, um, and and I hope I can still obviously contribute to this industry uh, in 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 giving back. Uh, so an industry that has given so much to me uh, with great uh, people and, and uh, mentors that have uh, taught me, you know, how to really make a difference and how tourism can also be a tool for peace and for understanding of people. So I think, you know, I mean, we know people, uh, mutual friends of, of uh, uh, you and me that uh, I think we both have learned from and, and, and that are role models. So I, I, I hope that I, I can take my learnings and, and, and continue to contribute uh, to the tourism industry. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, it is a fascinating industry and many, of those listening to us now are part of this industry. And um, I think everyone is suffering. Uh, no one really has a crystal ball what's going to be next. And we just have to get through it. Uh, tourism will continue. Um, I'm, we cannot just kill tourism, it's impossible. People need to travel, they need to get out. Uh, and if it's safe, of course, that's what we all want. But I think people will even travel when it's not safe. It just, uh, you cannot just uh, lock people up and uh, we've gone through this now for almost two years in almost every corner of the world. Um, so I, I think we're at a breaking point and I can see it here in Hawaii. Um, unfortunately, we have a high increase in COVID numbers and COVID death, but no one seems to be shocked. Um, we had only one tenth of these numbers a little bit more than a year ago and the state was locked up. Um, so people getting more resilience, they take it, they accept this is something we have to live with and we have to do it as safe as possible. And um, we, we don't know, but uh, what, what do you think? I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball either, but, but what, how do you see the future? Specifically, you've been involved so much also, I think in community tourism projects, um, they now become more and more important, aren't they? Well, I, I think, first of all, uh, as we're all looking at uh, tourism recovery, um, I actually, the first uh, thing to, to say is that I don't like the word recovery, because when we talk about recovery, we're actually saying, well, we're getting back to how we were before, right? I mean, when you're sick and you recover, you get back to how you were before, you know? But in the tourism industry, I think we can uh, all agree that what happened before COVID uh, wasn't healthy. Right. I mean, I, I've been talking about this concept of balanced tourism, and I would say that the pendulum, uh, you know, was was, you know, maybe swung to the right too much where, where we had over tourism. We had, you know, areas of, uh, you know, where, let's say it, it wasn't as inclusive as it could be. Uh, and, and there were then backlashes, as we all saw all over the world, uh, where, where residents were pushing back on tourists. Right. And this is not healthy. So, so I think, you know, I wouldn't look at recovery, I would look at resetting. How can we make tourism actually better? You have a logo there on the right hand side of my screen called rebuilding travel. So I, I think, you know, on one hand, yes, we want to rebuild it, but we also want to make sure that we are balanced, that we have a balanced tourism industry where the pendulum actually is in the middle, that where we are inclusive, um, where we look at you know, areas like climate change uh, that are existing threats, you know, and our mutual friend, uh, Jeffrey Lippmann, had I think, you know, really uh, um, made sure that that climate uh, change and, and, and climate friendly travel becomes uh, an agenda of, of everyone's uh, um, 
you know, plant. Uh, uh, but I, I think, you know, that's, I think it's the first thing is to, to change the mindset when it comes to tourism. I also think um, there are obviously lots of good things that happened with that, even though the pandemic is, is uh, uh, you know, has horrible consequences. But on one hand, I mean, it forced us to stop. It forced us to think. It also forced us, as, as we can't stop traveling, to explore uh, more our own uh, backyard, right? I mean, domestic travel has grown, where normally it's very quick, we jump on a plane. But I mean, in Bangkok, I mean, I, I've spent a weekend uh, with my family in Chinatown um, or, or in other parts of, of Bangkok that normally I wouldn't you know, book a hotel there. It would be maybe if I go there just you know, uh, quickly for, for a half an hour, for an hour. But I mean, just you know, interacting with the community uh, is, is, is great. And that's something that I think now a lot of people said, well, you know what, maybe I don't have to jump on a plane right away. I can uh, stay closer. And uh, while international travel is important, especially for areas like, uh, you know, islands that, that really look for uh, international travel, but still, I think, you know, uh, staying closer to home also is more sustainable. The other thing that, that I, I think I, I'm seeing is the, the importance of digital and data, you know, and, and how can that be made of use to really drive sustainability, to learn more about customers, are still respecting obviously privacy laws. I mean, there's a lot of stuff coming out with Apple and Google, you know, that uh, location data is, is, is a lot harder to track, but still I think there are ways through permission, uh, how we can create value uh, to consumers and get richer data that again, uh, then makes the whole process a lot more valuable in terms of how we develop tourism and how we promote tourism. So do you see in the future that we're, that our meeting industry will shift more to the Zoom part, or do you see meetings continue? There are so many convention centers and meeting facilities all over the world that are empty, uh, literally empty. Um, and uh, but Zoom is booming. I mean, we're talking on Zoom right now. Uh, do you see this shifting so we can get to real meetings also? And where do you see the the healthy balance here? You know what I I think actually. The meeting industry will come back, and, and I think it will come back stronger for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, I think the meeting industry will get more sustainable and it will also get more innovative. Um, I mean, in 2016, we created, we, we uh, hosted our Mekong Tourism Forum in Luang Prabang in Laos. And um, Luang Prabang, as you know, I'm sure you've been a UNESCO heritage site, beautiful, one of the most beautiful places in the world, doesn't have or a big hotel or meeting venue. Now they have a, a, um, a, a larger hotel that where you can host some meetings. But at that time, 2016, we didn't have it. So what did we do? We created a very inclusive event where we actually had all the sessions hosted by small businesses all around Luang Prabang. So it wasn't one hotel wasn't the venue, but the entire town of Luang Prabang was the venue. So that means like a, a session on food tourism was in a restaurant. A session on river cruise uh, tourism was on a river cruise boat. Uh, a, a session on uh, um, nature-based tourism was in the botanical garden and so on. So, I mean, uh, it was very inclusive. It was very experiential and people got out, out of the meeting room. But it's just one example of pre-COVID, but I think we will see more innovation. And the other thing that we will see is that, you know, I think people will go to meetings again because you know you want to see that and and uh, and, and you've been to meetings already you've been, uh, been to the wtdc event you went to uh, other events already not many but you might be also become more selective because before um a a, a meeting wasn't hybrid you know either you go or you don't go but not every event maybe you need to go so i think it also increases uh, the 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 participation so, I mean, when we do a Mekong tourism forum, we get around 400 people there. You know, last August, I did our first destination Mekong summit and we had 2000 people, right? So, so suddenly we get a, a larger footprint of people that learn about the, the destination, in our case, the Mekong region. Um, obviously, if you have a hybrid event, you get the best of both worlds, but before, no event before COVID was actually streamed really you know you couldn't really uh, sign up some re uh, sessions might have been recorded but i think that's a huge opportunity of still being more innovative when it comes to physical events but also allowing people to to join this event 
uh, you know, via digital means. Yeah, and, and this is so true because not everyone has thousands of dollars all the time to spend on airline tickets and hotels to travel. And those that really wanted to be at the meetings and uh, they would have the chance again to do this. So I, I, I think what you said make, makes a lot of sense. Um, th this whole world actually has a chance to come together. And this is what you see with our own little group at WTN. We can get people together from 128 people out of just a few emails and have them interact. I mean, wow, I mean, we can do a lot more if, we, if this world, um, if, if we find a sustainable world to continue in this travel and tourism industry. And what you're mentioning, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. There are definitely going to be a, a lot of changes in the industry from, um, from what we see tourism. I also hope <clears throat> that some of the mass tourism activities so many destinations have started complaining about disappear. So we're building a better way of uh, people coming together. After all, tourism is meant to be interaction with people. And, and that's many times has been overlooked. Now, I think with being locked up for a year and a half or more, uh, we see the value again, how important it is really to interact with people. And, and that is definitely not mass tourism. So I think this demand would probably come on its own even. And, um, and thanks to people like you um, guiding us into these type of uh, streams necessary to actually change the industry to a way it becomes actually sustainable and more fun and, and safer as well is very important. Uh, today, we, we had Diana uh, from Jamaica. Many of you know it. She's a leader in community tourism, celebrating her 70th birthday. And she did this on Zoom, but she also had a party at the same time. So you see, you can extend your reach quite, uh, quite easily. But um, Jens, it has been a pleasure of, um, having you here in my living room on Zoom today. <laughs> and and uh, congratulations again. And uh, I wish you all the best to whatever you do in the future. You said you're going to stay in the industry. So that's good to know. So I'm, I'm sure whatever you do um, will be even better and greater. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it would also be help. Uh, it would also help the industry and it would help sustainability and it would help all these things you're passionate about. And um, well, this is, I think it's enough for two Germans to uh, speak English <laughs> between Thailand and, and Hawaii. But it was a pleasure having you here on this event at Breaking News, um, on our Breaking News show. And congratulations again, Jens. And uh, anyone who wanted to know about know more about Jens, just go to heroes.travel now and you find Jens' profile. And of course, uh, once he changes his um, affiliation, we will uh, gladly update this as well. So you know where to find him, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> but uh, uh, but um, I, I wish you a nice uh, day in Bangkok. Stay safe. And um, hopefully we see each other or talk to each other again very soon. Thank you, Thomas. And thanks again for the recognition. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored and humbled by, uh, by that. And uh, uh, thanks for all the work you do with uh, bringing people together. I think as we, I think can all agree, I think now it's more important than ever. And I'm sure you'll be one of the first ones to know uh, once um, I can share where I will be ending up. So thank you so much and stay safe. All right, Jens. You take care. Aloha and uh, sabadikab. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.